Recently I uploaded a video, Intro Prime Number Theorem. In it I use the two statements of the theorem that you can see on the screen here. In it I also explain that log is to the base e, pi x is the number of primes less than or equal to x, and this funny tilde sign, asymptotic equivalence, means that these two statements are the same. If those things are not uh, obvious to you, then I strongly suggest you have a look at my video intro prime number theorem before you get into this video. Now this video is an intro, so it's an introduction, basic level, and today we're going to be looking at the proof of the prime number theorem. There are two sorts of proofs of the prime number theorem. The first is or are analytic proofs, and these involve integration of complex valued functions on the complex plane. The second sort are elementary proofs, and these do not require things like integration of complex valued functions. However, the elementary proofs are incredibly difficult, um, and today I'm going to use the original, I'm going to explain the original proof that I went through, which is an analytic proof. So I want to try and achieve three things today. The first is I want to show you the steps in the proof. The second is I want to show you how the analytic gets into it. In other words, at what point do we start using complex valued functions? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because after all this is not a video about complex valued functions and complex analysis, but I will show you where that process starts. And the final thing is I want to explore a little bit about how does log get into this after all, we're saying that pi of x is asymptotically equivalent to x on log x. So how does log get involved in something that's about counting prime numbers? Okay, so let's start. We're going to use this style of summation formula throughout today. So pi x, we say, is the sum for all primes p, where p is less than or equal to x, of 1. So for every prime less than or equal to x, we count 1. And after all, that is the definition of pi of x, the number of primes less than or equal to x. So to start this off, we need to introduce a new function, theta x. And theta x is the sum for all primes p, p less than or equal to x, of log p. So instead of having a 1 there, we've now got log of p. So Here's an example, theta 10 equals the sum for all primes p less than or equal to 10 of log p, and that means that theta 10 equals log 2 plus log 3 plus log 5 plus log 7. So the first step in the analytic proof was that it was proven that if theta x is asymptotically equivalent to x, then in fact pi x is asymptotically equivalent to x on log x. So this immediately shows us where the log gets into this problem, which is about prime numbers, right at the first step. And I'll show you 95% of this proof at the end of the video, if you're interested, but if you're not, you don't need to stick around for it. So once it's proven this if-then statement that I've got up here, then it's clear that it will suffice to just show that theta x is asymptotically equivalent to x, because now the proof uh, tells us that if that's true, then we, we've proven the prime number theorem. So now all that we need to do is prove that theta x is asymptotically equivalent to x. So the next step was to create a new function, psi of x. And this time psi of x is the sum of for all primes p, where p to the power m is less than or equal to x, and we're going to sum log p. So in this case, rather than summing every prime, we're summing every prime power. So let's have a look at how this works. What's psi of uh, 10? Well, it's a sum for p prime p to the power of m less than or equal to 10 of log p. So you can see this is similar to theta x. Okay, so the second step of the proof is that it was proven that if psi of x is asymptotically equivalent to x, then theta x is asymptotically equivalent to x. So now it will just suffice to show that psi of x is asymptotically equivalent to x. So how are we going to do that? Well, we now create the third function. 
psi 1x. Now psi 1x is what's called a smoothing function. If you graphed psi of x, you'd see that it's a step function. It jumps every time you get to a prime power. So one technique in number theory is to use smoothing functions, which smooth that out. And one way to do that is to use integration. So we let psi 1x equal the integral from 1 to x of psi t dt. And if you plotted that, you'd see that it smooths out the psi function. So the third step of the proof is to show that if psi 1x is asymptotically equivalent to x squared on 2, then psi x is asymptotically equivalent to x. So having proven all these statements, it now suffices to just show that psi 1x is asymptotically equivalent to x squared on 2. Now at this point, we have this expression for psi 1x, and the next step of the proof is actually to introduce the analytic part of the proof, and that is to also show that psi 1x is equal to this monstrosity here. So that was proven by mathematicians. Now this is a, this part here, this whole bit here is a complex valued function because s is, s is a complex number. This uh, zeta s and zeta dash s are just the Riemann zeta function and the derivative of that function. So we do have a complex valued function here. This integral um, upper and lower bound uh, tells us that we're integrating along a line, um, along the line C. So if we've got the complex plane here, this is telling us to integrate over this entire line for C where C is any number greater than one. And then we multiply by x squared divided by 2 pi i. So I'm not going to prove that psi 1x is also equivalent to this integral, but um, that was proven. And having then uh, proven that, it was then, uh, through some more calculations, shown that psi 1x is in fact equivalent to x squared on 2, or asymptotically equivalent to x squared on 2. And now we can see how the whole proof works. Here's a slide that shows you all the steps that I've gone through. And if all the five statements that are in light grey here are proven, then we can conclude, therefore, the prime number theorem is proven. If you want to stick around, I'll show you most of the proof of the first statement here. But before I do that, I'll just let you know about some of my other videos. If you like this video, you might like intro Poincaré conjecture, proof of Fermat's last theorem, and the intro Riemann hypothesis. I've also got favourite mathematical stories as a playlist, things like the number E is everywhere, the largest number, the Made Easy uh, playlist, high school and university exam and test questions like equivalence relations made easy, Chinese remainder made easy, and finally how things work, where I explore using only basic high school maths, how GPS, JPEG, Google search and encryption works. Okay, so now let's finish this off by doing the proof that if theta x is asymptotically equivalent to x, then pi x is asymptotically equivalent to x divided by log x. So I thought the way to, to do this might be to start up here where I'm just looking at theta 10. And from what we had before, you can see that's what theta 10 is equal to. Now this is critical here. We're going to rearrange this a little bit. This first line here, there's only one prime less than 2. So pi 2 is 1 and pi 1 is 0. So we have 1 minus 0 here. So we have 1 times log 2 which is what we need. Then the next line, we have two primes less than three and one less than two. So pi three minus pi two is one. So one times log three is log three. Next line, pi four is two. There are only two primes less than four. And pi three is two as well. So here we have two minus two times log four. So that's zero times log four. Log four is not included, and nor should it be in um, theta 10. And then we go right down the bottom, the last one is pi 10 minus pi 9, which is 0, times log 10. So log 10 is not included. So these, we can use the pi x or the pi function to, as a sort of a 
indicator function for when we have a prime and when we don't. Okay, now here's a cute part. We can group this using the pi. So here we have pi 2 times log 2 minus pi 2 times log 3. And here we have uh, pi 3 times log 3 minus pi 3 times log 4. And we can continue that process all the way down. Now there are two ends that we, we don't have the pi number twice. Up the top we've got negative pi 1, but that's just 0, so that doesn't matter. But down the bottom here we've got pi 10 times log 10. And there's no offset for that. So what I'm saying is we have pi 10 times log 10 plus for each uh, n from 1 up to 9, we have pi n times log n minus log n plus 1. Next line, I'm just going to get rid of the negative sign here. Well, actually, I'm just going to swap the log n and log n plus 1. I'm going to swap them around, and that means I need a negative here. Now, this is quite uh, cute here. We replace log n plus 1 times log n. I'm sorry, log n plus 1 minus log n. We replace this bit here with the integral of 1 on, over t dt between n and n plus 1. Now what I'm going to do is expand out the summation. So you can see here I've got the term uh, minus pi 2 times the integral from 2 to 3, 1 over t dt. Now this pi 2 doesn't change between 2 and 3. Um, so in terms of the integral, we can just put the pi 2 inside here. And if you think about it a bit further, you can see that rather than having pi 2, we could just have pi t because pi t over this range is just pi 2. So when I collapse all of all of those integrals again, I can now just put, neg um, so what have we got? We've got theta 10 is equal to pi 10 times log 10 minus the integral pi t on t dt between 1 and 10. Now if I divide, I want to divide all of that by 10. So I get pi uh, theta 10 on 10 minus pi 10 on divided by 10 divided by log 10 minus 1 on 10 pi on t dt, uh, pi, yeah, pi on t dt between 1 and 10. So this is for 10, but if I was just going to do it for a general x, then I'll replace all the 10s with x's, so I get this line here. Now it's true, but I'm not going to prove it here, that this bit here, this negative 1 on x times the integral, that just goes off to 0 as x goes to infinity. So, actually I don't like this last line here, what should we write here? So this bit goes to zero, so now we've got these two bits here. So we can say that if theta x on x approaches one, as x approaches infinity, then pi x divided by x on log x must approach one as x approaches infinity as well. And so that means that if theta x is asymptotically equivalent to x, then pi x is asymptotically equivalent to x on log x. And now we're done.